Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WIPB and Indiana Public Radio at Ball State University. Today we are chatting with Watasha Barnes Griffin, CEO of YWCA of Muncie. Watasha has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Watasha, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Talk about the range of different programs that you offer to Muncie citizens. YWCA, you said Muncie, we have just, um, January 1, our name has changed, so we are YWCA Central Indiana. However, um, YWCA serves um, the community um, in, as a whole, um, a very diverse community, and so we have a very diverse programming to, to match that. So we are one of the oldest and largest uh, multicultural organizations across the country and women-led. And so what we do are we provide services that will empower women in, in every aspect of their lives, women and children. Um, specifically, we have those initiatives that focus around economic empowerment, health and safety, um, and civil rights and social justice. We're, we're, we're at a time right now where there's a lot of concentration on um, on the voices of women, on the leadership of women, on the sensibility of women. Talk about how that sensibility has informed how this organization has served the community over the years. The YWCA has been um, a pioneer for change and in the women's movement um, since 1800s. And so locally, since about 1911, um, Muncie wanted to be a part of that movement. And so we um, established the YWCA in 1911, and in 1927, they planted the building um, downtown Muncie. Um, but YWCA is 220 associations across the country. We have a huge national brand that supports and undergirds each of our associations, but they have always been that voice and that vehicle, that pioneer for change as it relates to women. And so with the, the climate across the country now, um, it's not that we've not been doing this work, we've been doing it, but it's just more prominent and, 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 and you hear us a little more louder at this point in time. Um, it's really important to have the woman voice and the, the woman in leadership. Not that our voices are silenced, but sometimes they're not always heard like we need them to be heard. And so YWCAs are very um, intentional about having women in leadership and our board of directors has you know a female-led board and um, we need men to help us do our work but we just want to be the ones who um, lead lead that lead that work so in terms of of the various uh, programs that you have we talked about racial and social justice economic empowerment and health and safety Let's go through each of those programs and deconstruct the kinds of services that you provide, starting with racial and social justice. When the YWCAs were established in Muncie, it was it was segregated. Um, I can recall stories of, of women who have a 90-year-old woman that had a conversation with me um, maybe six months ago and realized that I was the CEO of the YWCA, and she said, you know, when I was in high school, I, I was so excited to learn how to swim, and I had taken um, health and so the Muncie Central School that I was at, at Muncie Central um, they did not have the pool and so we were all instructed that our classes would take place at the YWCA downtown and she's like I was so excited that first day to be able to walk from school and go down to the YW and go in to begin my swim lessons and they told me that I would not be able to swim there and, and she's like I was like no my schedule says and they're like but you you cannot swim here you are not welcome so you you have to leave. And so um, I think even with um, women having the rights to vote and the fight that women have had um, over the years, women of color were not initially a part of well, it was that a, movement. It was a segregated, so it was a segregated uh, um, facility and, and African Americans were not allowed. We were not allowed. Uh, we were not allowed. And so I think as the movement, with the YWCA movement continued and continued to grow, they recognized that we have aired um, maybe some just by by choice, some by ignorance, and so we want to rectify that. And so um, in 2000, the uh, 2009, they changed their the full mission to be eliminating racism, empowering women, and to promote peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Because they recognize that we need to uh, make sure that we stand loud and proud with women, all women, and so. 
when it comes to racial and social justice for us, it is just really making sure that um, our community is aware that there, there are issues of race and we don't want to be controversial, but we want to have discussions. And so our programming talks about um, equality for all, um, empowering of each other, um, standing against racism. So we have some specific events and one will take place in April, which is standing against racism, just coming together um, as a community to acknowledge, yes, that we are different, but we are so, so much alike. And so our work is just to, to make sure that there is justice and equality for all. So talk about how you empower people economically through your programs and help them navigate their own solutions. So women often, of course, they are the, the life givers and they birth, um, they birth life. And so they, they, they need to be able to take care of themselves and others. We are nurturers by, by trade and we want to ensure that we are not only nurturing um, emotionally, um, but able to provide physically and monetarily. And so when we look across the country and we look at um, careers and employment and, and, and there are definitely gaps in, in pay and the gender equality as it relates to, to the pay gaps um, for non-black and brown women to white women and to all women, there is, there is that disparity between men and women. And so we want to make sure that we are educating and um, providing financial literacy opportunities so that women are able to be stable and self-sufficient um, as they live their lives. So this is really trying to um, encourage self-advocacy. Um, yes, there are inequities, uh, but, but the, the point of what you're doing is not to become the, the fighter for, but more the um, the, uh, a group that can assure women that they can stand up for their, their, the value of their labor and ensure that they are being remunerated in, in uh, parallel with uh, men who are providing the same type of service. And that's true. And that is exactly, is exactly what we want to do. But we also want to empower that woman to say, you know, I am qualified and have the tools to be able to go into her employer and say, you know, I, I deserve this raise or just giving voice to um, their feelings. We do want to advocate for women and, and to ensure that pay is equitable. Um, so I had the pleasure of being able to go and lobby and, and do some advocacy work around, you know, um, gender pay. Um, but on a local level, we want to ensure that the women that we work with and the women in our communities have the tools and resources and have the support to be able to um, get the tools needed to be able to, to advocate for themselves. So you families. do some lobbying uh, at, uh, uh, at the governmental level and also with the Chamber of Commerce and, the, and those types of organizations? Absolutely. And then also, uh, do you provide workshops that, that allow women to air their concerns and, and try to have sort of um, a, a community self-support network? We do, so we work closely with, with a group here in um, locally called Women in Business Unlimited. And so it is about the woman who is in business, the professional woman, the woman that is coming up um, to that level. We work with that group, absolutely. I go right to the chamber and I'll have conversations with, with Jay Julian and, and those in economic development and, and talk about like, jobs that are in our community or what can what work can come this way so that we can make sure that women have um, the ability to be sustainable. So. And in health and safety, we have a, a whole series of, of issues that attach to the fact that the population of Muncie has been shrinking mm -hmm. uh, somewhat for years. You have certain areas where, um, where uh, there is urban blight, mm -hmm. uh, there are abandoned uh, buildings, abandoned businesses and so on. Um, that all affects uh, health, safety, housing. Talk about those programs. So health and safety, um, we want to make sure that the women that we serve directly through our emergency programs have um, access to adequate health care coverage. We also want to make sure that and to promote to all women that health care coverage is available and here are the ways that you can access those, those, those things. And when there are um, the issues in government around health care, we want to be one of the, the biggest voices speaking um, on health care coverage for women and the, and the importance of that. 
So with low income and with poverty levels and things of that nature in our community, the women that we would serve through our health and safety slash emergency shelter programs, when they come to us, they, they, they come with very little. Um, they may not have the resources, the skills, or the tools um, at that point to be self-sustaining. And so we want to provide services to them, first of all, emergency shelter. Right. Then you don't have that that pressure of worrying about where you and your children will lay your heads. And these are women of all ages. Women they could be ages. they could be uh, young single women. They could be women with children, uh, elders. Um, and then you have all these different intersecting needs. Some people come in. Um, poverty is their biggest issue. Some people come in. Uh, their biggest issue might be addiction, and uh, which leads to to these needs. Uh, there might be other issues that, that stand in the way. Maybe they're intimidated by dealing with paperwork or, or maybe their, their literacy issues. Uh, you actually have to address people where they come in because the alternative can be as bad as uh, death and, and, Absolutely. and, and uh, real physical harm individuals. Absolutely. So we always say that we, we work with the master level woman down to that one who just generational poverty um, and everything in between. But every woman that we serve um, in our emergency shelter and that, that emergency shelter program that we have, we want to make sure that they have their life areas and those main life skills and those life needs are met. And so we're going to always hit them initially with health care coverage, making sure they have that, food subsidies, making sure that those things are in place. We want to make sure they are healthy, physically, physical, mental, and emotionally. We want to make sure that they have um, those needs met. And so once we have met their basic human needs, then we can work on um, the skills that they would need to be um, sustainable on their own. Um, so we can't even begin to teach until we've made sure that their basic needs, Maslow's, hierarchy of needs. We have to meet those basic needs and so um, we do that. We're, we're here locally we are privileged enough to be in close proximity to like our public health care systems and um, our downtown development and you know you have your work one and you have the, the transportation companies. You have We have a lot of things that we need for the people that we serve in our shelter right outside our doors and so we work really in tandem and collaboration with those those groups and those organizations to make sure that we are doing all that we can to empower empower women. Latasha Barnes Griffin, thank you so much for sharing the work of the YWCA of Central Indiana. Yes. And uh, located in Muncie and serving the whole community. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.